Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Uh, this is a solo live stream, it's a question and answer live stream and it's basically open to loads of questions, whatever you've got on the subject of Rhaegar and uh, Liana, and also a little bit about uh, Elia, I think we'll probably sneak in there too. So uh, I've got a lot of, as always, I've got a lot of questions from my patrons. I've got a few super chats that came through before we got started. Um, uh, and let's get to them. Actually, the first thing I want to do, uh, if you are watching this live and if you're in the chat, can you please give a big thank you to my moderators? I've got uh, Chrissy Voldstones and Jojo Lady Dane are both in the chat. Uh, so, uh, guys, if you want to say hi to them, that would be fantastic. Okay, uh, let's get on to the questions. We're going to get straight into it. Um, I had a few super chats, as I said, uh, before we went live. Um, Maura Lee, first of all, thank you. Uh, I saw also your questions that you left over uh, on Patreon. I will get to them. I'm going to dot them through the whole of the live stream. Uh, Maura says, uh, for Elia, uh, which I think is fantastic. Elia Martel is one of my favourite characters, uh, my favourite under, uh, under understood uh, characters in the entirety of A Song of Ice and Fire. She does not have a voice in this. So often all these characters have got their own voices, uh, but she does not. Even with people like Rhaegar, people talk about him glowingly. We don't get people talking about Elio glowingly, so I have a soft spot for her because she is not given that voice. Uh, but uh, Maura says, thank you, Robert, for your past video um, on Elia, as well as the latest video you did on Rhaegar and Lyanna. Really looking forward to your Tower of Joy video and hearing your thoughts regarding what was going on besides the obvious. Uh, and yeah, so the Tower of Joy video will be coming soon. Uh, Moira, I just wanted to say uh, personally, we've been chatting this week uh, and you are a huge support, not just to me, but to the entire community. Thank you so much. Uh, and that was an incredibly generous uh, super chat as well. So thank you. We'll be getting to your questions very soon. Uh, Three-Eyed Monkey. Uh, asks, uh, legit John or bastard John, um, uh, which is a better fit thematically? Rightful king by birth or true king by merit? I accept Rhaegar plans to make John legitimate once he was king, but it remained the road not taken. So uh, I think this is a fantastic question about thematically what works best, because I think that George R. R. Martin is deliberately uh, trying to play on what we might call a fantasy trope, um, but also uh, sort of in a more literary style, he is trying to use the hero's journey to take us down a path with John. So John is, we see this if you read lots of fantasy stories, you see this time and time and time again, this quite stereotypical character who grows up an orphan, doesn't know who his parents were, um, but then actually they finally discover that they are indeed the heirs to the throne um, and they are also the subject of prophecy, which is going to mean that they are the people who are going to save the entire world against this oncoming evil and at the end of it they're going to ascend to the throne and be righteous, a righteous king. It all tends to be a, a man rather than a woman, this character. That is the, the plot device that George R. R. Martin has taken and is using so far. Now, for that, then yes, that means that John should be legitimate if that is something that he would take to its natural conclusion. Personally, what he's been saying about uh, wanting to sort of move away from a few of the fantasy tropes says to me that that ending is not gonna happen exactly as we would expect it to. That could mean a number of different things. At the very least, it means that he is not going to be viewed as the, um, the only candidate to be king, the only heir apparent. And this is something we'll come back to again and again. We've got quite a few questions about legitimacy, but the headline here is that what we are looking at almost certainly in A Song of Ice and Fire, they've kind of skated over it in the show, but in A Song of Ice and Fire is a good old fashioned Targaryen succession crisis. And I think that means from John's perspective, he is not going to be placed as this, of course he's the king, everyone else is just wrong if they think otherwise. So uh, in terms of thematically, George R. R. Martin is playing with this idea of him being, um, 
this perfect uh, hero's journey character, uh, which would imply that he's legit. But because he's playing with it, that actually um, means that we have to slightly mistrust it if it makes sense. Uh, Linda Prasuta, thank you so much. $25, no question there that I can see, but that's an incredibly generous super chat. Thank you so much. Um, Jack Hurst uh, says, um, uh, again with a super chat, a, a deserved donation as my Friday morning journey to work wouldn't be the same without your live streams. Thank you, that's very kind. Just wanted to check, you still plan to do videos as regularly after season eight ends? Uh, the answer is yes, I am. In fact, if anything, I, I'm hoping over the course of this year that I might be able to increase the amount of videos that I'm doing because uh, what, uh, what I find at the moment is the limiting factor is that I'm doing all of this right now. This is just me. I come up with the thoughts, I, I write them, I record them, I edit them, I upload them, I do the live streams. Every, everything is me. Um, what I'm hoping is that there are some jobs within that, like, for example, audio editing, that I think other people can do. Probably they could do better than me. It's not a strength of mine. Uh, so I'm actively looking for people who can do things like that. That should free up a bit of time for me to do more stuff. Yes, I'm not stopping at season eight. Uh, I'm committed to covering the books as well when they come out. Still, fingers crossed uh, for uh, The Winds of Winter later this year. I think it's looking quite likely. We think that most years, but I think it is looking quite likely this year. Added to which, there are other series that I'm, TV shows that I'm looking to uh, sort of branch out to a little bit. Uh, if you've been on my channel for a while, then you know that I covered Westworld season two, so I should be doing a bit more on Westworld. Um, there's also obviously the spin-off from Game of Thrones. There's a Lord of the Rings uh, series, which is in development at the moment. I quite like Black Mirror, so expect as well as maintaining the level of content that we've got at the moment on Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire, expect a few other different things as well. So the short answer is yes, uh, I will carry on making videos after season eight. Um, uh, so, uh, and guys, by the way, just let me know in the chat if, there, if there's anything uh, in particular you think that you would like me to be covering uh, after season eight. There's there's a lot of options out there. I might have a little bit extra capacity, so uh, please do let me know. Um, Marvin Martin, thank you again sir, for the super chat. That's very kind. Um, this is returning to the subject of, of Rhaegar and Lyanna, asking if Rhaegar wanted to kidnap or secretly, secretly marry Lyanna, why publicly make the move and alienate his allies also? I think this is a fascinating question because it, it, it will tie in with a lot of what I'm going to be talking about in a moment, which is who knew what and when. Now, I think when he set off, he I don't think it was from Dragonstone initially to go and get Lyanna eventually. I don't think it was with the intention of doing... Uh, of immediately marrying her without setting in train lots of things. Uh, I think that he wanted to build up a coalition around what he was doing, but events overtook them. Um, now, uh, he kept on sight his closest allies through this. So we've got Dawn, the Martells, who stayed with him through this. But I suspect that there were other people who he would have wanted to approach who perhaps he couldn't. And once the war was underway, actually he had to see that through and then do things. There's this great scene that Jamie remembers of when Rhaegar returns to King's Landing just before the Battle of the Trident. And Rhaegar seems quite uh, sad about some things that he didn't do beforehand. He, he says, you know, there's no point in dwelling over these things, if the road's path not taken and all the rest of it but there will be changes afterwards. And the implication there is that he, his plans were interrupted. He hadn't wanted to go down the route that he went down, uh, but that's what happened and he's gonna deal with it after the war. So this, this yes, we, could, we can look at this and say Rhaegar was being a bit foolish and not understanding everything that would happen. But at the same time, I don't think that that was his plan. He, he was not, Thinking it through in that, uh, in, in the depth that we perhaps do with the, the hindsight and the 360 degree knowledge that we have as readers. Um, anime lover Nicole uh, says, hey Robert, since you live in England, who is your favorite football team? 
Uh, and what country will you cheer for in the uh, the EK England exclusive? I assume that's the World Cup or the European Championships. Um, uh, in terms of my favourite football club, Manchester United is my team. Um, and I saw somebody in the chat earlier asking for a prediction on Arsenal versus Man U. Man U 2-0. You heard it here first. Um, who would I support? Uh, England internationally, obviously. Uh, that's my country. Um, I will also support um, when England get knocked out of major tournaments. I would also support uh, uh, whoever I think is playing the best football. I do have a soft spot, and I'm not just saying that because I know a lot of you are American. I do have a soft spot for Americans uh, and for the American football team. So I will, uh, or soccer team as you would call it. So I would happily support them too. Uh, I've got a family connection with America as well, so uh, so that kind of plays into it. But um, yeah, the, it, Man U and England is 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 who I'm after. Um, time for a kiss. Another super chat before we came on uh, line says one question you would ask George R R Martin. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, um, I think I wouldn't just ask him one direct question. I would probably just say, uh, tell me about Helen Reed or tell me about Blood Raven. I would just want him to give me a character understanding of one of these characters that we don't see their point of view uh, through the books, but we know that they're central to what was going on. Um, I'm sure if I spent some time, I could come up with some really insightful direct question to come up with. But what I would prefer actually is not just the answer to a very specific question. I would prefer his take on the character of of some of the people that we just hear about and what they were really like and what and the rest of it. And I think that would help me understand the story so much more than just getting one point of detail about something. Uh, so that's what I would do if I. Uh, if I had the chance, I would sit him down, get him drunk, and just say, tell me about how and read. Um, Alex uh, Gergen, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, have you ever considered covering the Cosmere of Brandon Sanderson? I love your style and think it would fit there well. No, is the short answer. I haven't. Uh, I think that's books uh, rather than TV show, but I don't know. It's not really come across my radar. Brandon Sanderson, I've read a couple of things like and rate him as a writer, um, uh, but uh, I, I haven't really got into it. A lot of people ask me whether I will cover various things. I will happily, I think at the moment, my focus is so much on this next season of Game of Thrones. After that, I'm just going to take a deep breath, go on a holiday and read lots uh, and uh, come up with ideas about other things that I can branch out into as well. So I would, uh, I will put that on my list and I will happily have a look at it. Um, so I think that's uh, got us caught up on uh, all the super chats from beforehand. Um, the way I'm going to do the rest of this is as always, um, if there are super chats, then I'll pick up on them as we go through. Uh, my questions from my patrons, incidentally, if, if you're a patron, you will know this. If you're not, then perhaps you don't. Uh, I always prioritise my patrons' questions when it comes to my live streams. I let people know a day or so, uh, sometimes a few hours, but in advance of each live stream, what the topic will be over on my Patreon page uh, and their questions form the basis of what we do. So if you're at all interested in that, please do check out uh, my Patreon page. So any questions my patrons leave for me there, I try my very best to get to. Um, the way I'm planning on doing this is I've, I want to take it roughly chronologically through uh, the story of Rhaegar and Lyanna and try and answer the questions there. So I've, I've, I'm going to bundle a few of the questions together and answer them in one when I think that they're connected um, rather than dotting about all over the place. So I hope that makes sense and uh, I hope that uh, makes for a slightly more logical move through rather than completely random. Um, uh, Jack Hurst, thank you so much. Ten pounds, that's very kind. Uh, managed to stay up for twenty minutes, but off to bed now. Understand that in the UK and paying in pounds, it's getting quite late here. Wanted to know if LML was king. Oh dear, uh, God save us all. If LML was king and you were his hand, would you be able to control him? Stop him burning anyone who doesn't believe in moon meteors? No, I think uh, if LML 
Uh, for those who do not know, LML, Lucifer Means Lightbringer, excellent content creator on A Song of Ice and Fire, um, uh, and a really good guy as well. Um, uh, he, I think ever since George R. R. Martin retweeted something about uh, a meteor hitting the moon or hitting the sun, uh, he is not going to give up on this theory. And quite right too. I actually buy into it a lot more than I would admit to him in person. Um, he's a really good guy. Uh, could I control him? I'd just do things behind his back without telling him. Um, Terry Pring, thank you so much. You said in another video, if R and L, Rhaegar and Lyanna got married, it would have been the Isle of Faces. But that doesn't make sense if the annulment uh, would take arranging to go through. This is um, a very good point, a very good question. I did say this in the past, I think that I thought that if they got married, it would probably be the Isle of Faces. My reasoning for that was that um, I felt that Lyanna would want to get married in the northern way, which meant being in front of a weirwood tree. They met up uh, for the second time near Harrenhal, we're told, which means that they were near the Isle of Faces, because the Isle of Faces is just south of Harrenhal. So that made sense to me. And I also really liked the symbolism of them going there uh, and, and marrying on the Isle of Faces. Um, this is one of those, uh, this is an example of uh, how uh, my thinking changes. I don't. I don't think that this is uh, well, the way I operate. Is not to come up with an idea and then stick by it, no matter what the evidence is. When the ev when I find new evidence, when I think through things more, I will happily shift my position on this. And you are very right. My latest video, uh, the main focus there was if they got an annulment. Uh, and and all of those things that would take a huge amount of time and it probably happened down in dawn which probably means that any marriage between the two of them wouldn't have happened at the other faces i agree and so now i'm probably going to change that my view on balance they probably didn't get married on the other faces i wish they had that would work really well for me uh but probably now i think that they they didn't get married they probably did have the equivalent of not a drunk septum, but that kind of thing. They, they could have easily got a septum to, to, to get them married. Um, uh, the, uh, who are, I think I just missed a super chat there. I'm just going to so, say uh, the Darkara. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, five pounds. Why was John named Aegon when Rhaegar already had a son called Aegon? Did Lyanna pick the name? Yes, I think Lyanna picked the name. Um, so, this was one of those things where we automatically assume a lot of us that Rhaegar must have picked the name. I do not think so. Uh, Rhaegar died around the time that John was born. Rhaegar was convinced that they were going to have a daughter because he was naming, it would appear, he was naming his children after the three original Targaryen conquerors. That means that the other one would be called um, uh, Visenya. That seems to be what he was expecting. Rhaegar was so convinced about prophecy, 100% kind of guy, that I personally think that he uh, he just said, it's got to be named Visenya. This is what our child is going to be named. So when he wasn't there and the baby was born a boy, I think that meant that Lyanna had this choice of what to call the baby. And... Then you say, I have to get into, well, what would she name this child? Uh, she will soon have heard that Rhaegar was dead, and she will soon have heard that Rhaegar's two children were dead, uh, two other children were dead. Now, I don't know whether this is the case, but I certainly understand. This is obviously in the on the show they said that John was called Aegon, um, I, I certainly understand the idea that maybe Lyanna might have wished to name uh, her new child somehow honouring those dead. And if she couldn't bring herself to name this child Rhaegar, then perhaps she might name the child Aegon after Rhaegar, Rhaegar's eldest son who died. So that might well be what was happening. But the, the crux of it is that this was Lyanna who named the child, not um, uh, not Rhaegar, because Rhaegar thought it was a daughter. Uh, LML, I see, has just come back to say, I would indeed listen to Robert's wise counsel where he might have. That is very kind. Uh, uh, and uh, um, 
I would gladly serve you, my liege. Um, uh, one other super chat before we move on to the patrons' questions. Kerry McDonald, why didn't Rhaegar provide more protection for Elia and his children? Uh, didn't he worry about his father? I, so, in terms of Elia and his children, I think that he knew that he, well, first of all, uh, they got they were safe up in Dragonstone, and that was fine. Then they got moved down into King's Landing, and I suspect that um, uh, the question is who would Rhaegar have used to protect them in some way? Um, he'd already got three of his King's Guards down there at the Tower of Joy. He couldn't, if he dispatched a member of the King's Guard back up to King's Landing, he couldn't get them to disobey whatever the king's orders were because the king's orders would almost certainly supersede his because they were the king's guard, not the uh, the, um, uh, the prince's guard. So uh, the question is, what is going on there? Personally, I think that he must have trusted her protection initially to one other member of the king's guard that we don't often talk about, who was Lewin Martell, who was Elia's uncle i think that he would probably have said okay he's in king's landing she's there he will be looking out for her she also had friends at court as well so i think that that's there in terms of when they were actually killed this was after rhaegar was gone so i don't think there was huge amounts he could have done at that point um and Liana Tarstark, great name, $10. Uh, do you think season eight will mirror season one? The teaser showed us a new queen in Winterfell like episode one. Um, and what importance do you think Jon's heritage in, is in taking out the Night King? Yeah, the teaser trailer um, had uh, all, all that little section that we had with uh, Daenerys arriving at Winterfell was a deliberate echoing of that first, or uh, one of those first scenes that we had in season one, episode one, with um, uh, when Robert Baratheon arrived and this time being Daenerys arrived. So yes, there was a deliberate echoing of those things going on there. I don't think that means that they're going to be echoing everything else in season one. I think that they will try and bring some things around full circle, but I don't think it's going to be a, a exact echoing of season one. In terms of John's heritage in taking out the Night King, um, this clearly was what, and we'll get onto this in a moment, but this clearly was what people, particularly the Blood Raven side of things, were thinking was necessary in order to create this hero to defend humanity, to have both uh, um, First Men blood and Targaryen blood to create this um, hybrid as it were of ice and fire so i think that is quite important um what i think is not necessarily going to be the case certainly in the books i certainly in the books i hope not so much in the show either is that this should not turn into a battle between john and the night king just the two of them slugging it out and the best warrior wins i don't think that's how this or how george r, r. martin wants this story to be uh, to be going, um, uh, and I don't think that, as a pacifist, I don't think that's where he will want it to end, the solution to all of this being a big battle and whoever's got the, uh, the the best sword wins. I don't think that's the end of it. So, yes, it matters to a certain degree. Um, uh, it matters in terms of prophecy, but it doesn't necessarily matter in terms of single-handedly taking on the Night King. Um, Susan Dunkel, uh, the good question saying, do you believe Jenny's song and the song of ice and fire are the same things? If so, what do those few lyric lines signify? Um, so for those who don't know, um, the song of ice and fire is mentioned specifically in the vision that Danny has in the house of the undying in the books, not not the show version, uh, where she sees Rhaegar, and Rhaegar is talking about his first son, Aegon, and he says that he is the prince who was promised, and his is the song of ice and fire. Jenny's song is a song 
um, uh, that uh, the ghost of High Heart asks for. It's about, we assume, about Jenny of Oldstones, who um, was down at Summer Hall. Um, now, the ghost of High Heart, this all kind of ties in together because the ghost of High Heart was best friends with Jenny of Oldstones, uh, and Jenny of, pardon me, Jenny of Oldstones, we think, died at Harren Hall. And uh, the ghost of High Heart says that she uh, she she grieved huge amounts. She basically she wallowed in the the grief that she had there at Harren Hall. Harren Hall, of course, this great fire, and outside that fire was born Rhaegar. Now Rhaegar, uh, many years later, went back again and again to Summer Hall, and I think some others think this as well that he must have met the ghost of High Heart. And the ghost of High Heart uh, was uh, somebody who had huge amounts of prophecy, uh, prophesied lots of different things, including making the prince that was promised prophecy, re remaking it for the Targaryens. And he would return there with songs. So I think that he returned there with the Song of Ice and Fire, which is a song about the prince that was promised. Jenny's song, I think, is a song more specifically about the fate of Jenny and what happened at Harren Hall. Could they be the same? Perhaps, but I personally think that they are, although they're probably both sad songs and they probably both have thematic connections, I think that they probably are different songs, different prophecies that are that are going on, because I think that basically what happened was that um, and I saw, I I didn't come up with this. This was, I, if I remember, I will put a link in the description, uh, a fantastic blog post that was describing this idea that he went there, heard a prophecy and turned it into a song because we know he went there with his harp and emerged with songs afterwards. So I think that's what happened. That makes a huge amount of sense to me. Um, uh, I think, let's have a quick look. I think I got um, uh, John Lamb, uh, 10 euros. Thank you so much. Uh, saying, uh, Rhaegar and Lyanna were selfish. Uh, Robert, I left a comment on Patreon. Yes, you did. I'm going to get to that one in just one moment. Thank you. And I will answer that in just a second, John. Um, Marvin Martin, uh, $10. Uh, North marriage, a loophole for polygamy and its issues in legitimacy. What convinced Rhaegar so strongly in these prophecies? Why King Guard, Why is the King's Guard with the Prince? So three questions there. I will answer them all quickly. The Northern marriage is not a loophole because the Northern marriage is counted as a legal marriage within Westerosi law. Uh, so you couldn't just have a, uh, a seven, uh, you know, a marriage by the seven and then uh, have another marriage in front of a heart tree, that doesn't work. That would count as polygamy. Uh, so it's not a loophole. What convinced Rhaegar so strongly in these prophecies? We just hear it's something he read. He first of all read, uh, and then it was correspondence with Maester Eamon that, that uh, convinced him that this was first of all about himself. Uh, and that was the thing that seemed to drive him. And then he felt that it was about his son uh, with being the prince that was promised. So uh, we're not told exactly what it was, uh, but I just think he, if you look back through the Targaryens, uh, to put it kindly, they have a history as a family of being very focused on uh, single issues and uh, things that are very focused in on them and their own self-importance. So we get Arian, who thought that if he drank wildfire, he would turn into a dragon, for example. We get Aegon, who became, we're told, obsessed with how to ha with having to hatch a dragon. Rhaegar, for me, seems very similar in this vein, just very focused in on the prophecy that he or his son or whoever is going to be the prince that was promised. That's just the way that they seem to roll. In terms of uh, the Kingsguard, why were the Kingsguard with the prince? Because the Kingsguard, uh, we don't know their exact oath. Uh, we get little hints of it uh, all dotted throughout the books. Uh, but it seems that they, uh, although they are there primarily to protect the king, the king can say that, or allow them to be 
following the orders of other members of the family. So they have a sort of slightly broader role in protecting the rest of the family. And what happened with uh, with Rhaegar is he certainly seemed to have a couple of people who were very closely linked to him, obviously Arthur Dane, uh, but also uh, Oswell Went. Those two seem to be part of his inner circle. So they, although they were members of the Kingsguard, they would very much be uh, protecting uh, Prince Rhaegar. So that was why they were, they were there. And uh, Gerald Hightower, the third of the three at the uh, Tower of Joy, he arrived later. He was sent by the king to get Rhaegar to go back. Having done what the king said and Rhaegar agreeing to go back, Rhaegar then seems to have given him a, another order to stay there. So that was what was going on there. Um, OK, I think I'm just a little bit caught up now on uh, the Super Chat. So let's let's get into the um, questions from my patrons. Uh, John St. Baptiste, who, if you don't know, um, pardon me, John St. Baptiste, who, if you don't know, has got a channel of his own, a great music channel. So if you're into music, please do go and check out John St. Baptiste. Uh, he says, I support the Great Northern Conspiracy Theory for the most part. But my question is, why, of all people, did Lord Stark betroth Lyanna to Bobby B, Robert Baratheon? He, of course, knew his daughter and must have at least had a sense of who Robert was as a person. The match has never made any sense to me unless he took parenting lessons from Tywin Lannister. So um, this is an interesting question. This is about why Lyanna effectively was betrothed to Robert Baratheon. I think there are two answers to this um, the first one is that there were actually a limited number of potential matches around at that time uh, for highborn uh, women. That there was there was a very limited stock, as it were. Now, uh, so that's answer number one. So you look around at who the other potential people might be. Are any of the other ones? Um, uh, looking quite as good as that. Uh, well, possibly you could go with um, uh, Jamie Lannister, maybe. I, I don't know. But Robert Baratheon was a lord. He was a lord of uh, the Stormlands. The Baratheons are one of the most powerful families in the entirety of the Seven Kingdoms. That comes across even more, I think, in Fire and Blood than we already uh, realised. Uh, so this was a hugely good political match uh, for them. So I think that's thing number one. Rickard Stark was very much on to uh, trying to get uh, a good political match. Uh, secondly, I don't think he would have known Robert Baratheon that well um, because Rickard Stark spent most of his time up north. But what he would have gone on is the recommendation of Ned Stark. Ned Stark did know Robert Baratheon very well. We know that Ned proposed it. He passed it on to his father with an endorsement, we would guess, and defended the match when Lyanna challenged him about it and said, oh, I'm not too entirely sure about this. I don't like his character. I just think he's just going to carry on doing these things again and again and again. And Ned defended him. So I think it's pretty clear that the, the voice here uh, commending Robert Baratheon was Ned Stark. So the short answer is that it was a great match. Rickard looked for somebody that he trusted to, to tell him whether or not Robert Baratheon was the right kind of person. And Ned said, it's all right. That, I think, is what happened. So um, let's get on to these issues of prophecy, uh, which are at the heart of what Rhaegar, what was driving uh, Rhaegar, um, uh, and actually just very quickly picking up um, uh, LML in the chat, you're right, I've got lots of questions to get through today. So guys, if you're if you're asking questions and I'm not answering them, do apologise. I will pick up on questions as and when I can. I'm trying to get through as many as I possibly can. Um, uh, just... Um, da -da -da -da. I will quickly answer this uh, this uh, super chat from Donna Daly before getting into the ones about prophecy. Uh, £10, thank you so much, Donna. That's very kind. Off topic, still saying, uh, sorry, do you think that Tyrion may have made a deal with Cersei? Uh, this is on the show. Uh, 
sort of up to date on the show that if she supported Danny, etc., he would convince Danny to make Cersei's baby her heir. I personally don't see any evidence of this. I know a lot of people have been think, saying perhaps he did. He came to some deal. If he did come to some deal, then Cersei double-crossed him just as much as she double-crossed anyone, and they will find this out the moment that Jaime gets up to Winterfell, so it's a very short-lived deal. So uh, if they did come to some kind of agreement, then I don't think that agreement's going to survive episode one, is what I'm trying to say, uh, and I haven't seen any evidence that they did, other than a slightly awkward cut at the end of a scene. So um, I like the idea. Uh, and I think that Tyrion would be the kind of person who would try and strike deals, but I didn't see any evidence, um, and uh, I I don't think that it would the deal would last long. Uh, so let's uh, let's talk about prophecy for a bit, guys. Um, uh, Guy Smulders over on Patreon says the fight against the others was absent from Fire and Blood. It was there was absolutely no mention of the others there. Uh, but Dragonfire seems crucial for that fight. What if Rhaegar was the first to realise that the goal of the Targaryens or the dragons was to fight the White Walkers, not conquering Westeros? That's why he started over with Vienna and ignored Westerosi politics. Um, he didn't think the rebellion was important. Um, what would make him realise so sudden, suddenly maybe a whisper from the Three-Eyed Raven? One of the videos, I've got about four more videos in my series about Robert's Rebellion and the Tower of Joy. Probably the last one I do is trying to tie this all together with what Blood Raven was up to and Howland Reed and all of this. And crucial to this is the, um, already mentioned her, the Ghost of High Heart, who was earlier known as the Woods Witch, who came with Jenny of Old Stones to the court. It was her who... Um, uh, talked about the prince that was promised and said the line of the prince that was promised has to come down through the Targaryens. And that was what led or <clears throat> led to the family trees being what they were, were and kind of like froze the, the gene pool, as it were, for the, the last two or three generations of them, um, which meant that they were um, uh, not just Targaryen, but they also had Blackwood blood in them, so uh, in heritage, uh, which means that they had both First Men magic and Targaryen magic, which I think was quite important. So I think that Blood Raven was behind it all the way back a hundred years or so ago, and um, whether Rhaegar would therefore realise that the goal of Targaryens was to fight the White Walkers, he was very much. Uh, thinking that he firstly and then his son would be the prince that was promised, which is very much tying in with this kind of Azora High idea, which is very much about facing the others. So yes, I think he did believe that that was what was going on and that that was the fate of the Targaryens and his family and his line in particular. But um, uh, was he the first to realise this? I don't think he necessarily was, I think, that Maester Eamon was also digging through these kinds of things. Um, uh, Michael Smith, yes, the prince pro that was promised prophecy that would come from the line of Aerys and Rhaella, um, uh, so that was what was going on down there. Uh, and uh, in terms of, uh, was he the first to do this? I think this was done in conjunction with Maester Eamon, who understood it, uh, and I think probably that prophecy was around for a long time and others would probably have made the link. But I think he made the link personally to him and his family. Um, Lady Elaine Fairchild, um, this links into this one, saying, could Howland have had a complementary prophecy or agenda that helps align the women of the story with Rhaegar's Targaryen prophecy? It's so suspicious that you went to the Isle of Faces right before all these things got started. It's compelling when I think about the idea that he was involved romantically with Elia's friend, Shara. Um, so yes, I agree. Um, I think that it is very suspicious that Helen Reed went to the Isle of Faces just before all of this happened. I think that was absolutely central to this. One of the earlier videos I did, I've dread to think when it was at least a year ago, possibly 18 months ago, was about Helen Reed and the Isle of Faces. Uh, I will pick up on a lot of the stuff that I talked about there in this video that I've just been mentioning. 
Howland was central to what was going on here. In the Blood Raven, Howland Reed Axis, he was effectively the person on the ground doing everything. He was, I mean, you think about it, the person who at Harren Hall sort of got them together, Rhaegar and Lyanna, in the first time, first place, because it was him being beaten up by the squires that led to the need for the Knight of the Laughing Tree. The Knight of the Laughing Tree uh, was almost certainly Lyanna, and it was Rhaegar hunted for the Knight of the Laughing Tree, and I think found the Knight of the Laughing Tree, and that, for me, was when they met. So that was all kick-started by um, Howland. So Howland is like the man on the ground doing all of these kind of things. In terms of uh, aligning the women of the story with this, yeah, I think uh, this is primarily about uh, Ashara, Ashara Dane you're talking there. I do subscribe to the idea if you've never heard the idea before, it sounds quite wacky, but there's a lot of evidence to, evidence to support it, that Ashara Dane and Howland Reed were an item. And that, I think, pulled them into all of this. Um, and uh, I think in terms of Liana, Liana, I think there's every chance that she would have been pulled into this as well later on. I don't see any reason why they couldn't have looped around via Summer Hall on their way to... Uh, the Tower of Joy, that's uh, certainly on the way. Um, Karis the Beast, linking to this, did Rhaegar share his lifelong prophecy obsession with Lyanna? And what do you believe her reaction would have been? I think she seems quite a grounded person, uh, and I think that she would have needed proof that this was true. And I think that Rhaegar's response to that would have been to take her to Summerhall, which was where he got his proof from, from meeting um, the Woods Witch, the Ghost of High Heart, who was there. So I think that that would be what he would do, and I think that might have convinced her. But um, I don't know whether, for the story, she had to be convinced of it. She might have just decided, you know what, I kind of like this Rhaegar guy. He's got some strange ideas about prophecy, but he's a good guy anyway. So I don't think it's necessary. We don't, though, the honest answer is we don't know um, it's enough about Liana and what she thought about prophecy to say um, uh, exactly how she would respond to it. Um, uh, Torsten D um, is asking about the dragon must have three heads prophecy. Um, is it possible that the prophecy isn't even connected to the Azora High last hero? Maybe Rhaegar misinterpreted a prophecy which was aimed at Aegon's conquest, conquest or any other future event, and it cost everything. I think, uh, yeah, there's a lot. We build up the dragon has three heads into something that I personally think is way in excess of what uh, it deserves as, as a prophecy, because it's not, it's not really a prophecy. The only time it turns into something that sounds quite prophetic is when Rhaegar himself says the dragon must have three heads. Um, this seems to come from the idea of the three-headed dragon, which is obviously the Targaryen symbol. And that Targaryen symbol, because they didn't have a sigil, it was only in Westeros that people have sigils. The Targaryens didn't have a sigil before they arrived, <clears throat> pardon me, onto, onto Westeros. So they had to make it up and they made it up based on the three Targaryens there at the time. So this was not so much some kind of ancient prophecy that's, that they are trying to fulfill, so much as a, it, this is what the tar, em, embodies the Targaryens. And I think that when Rhaegar was saying it, I think there's a very good chance that he was just saying it to sort of say, this is what symbolically the Targaryens should be, and and. I am trying to recreate the original tar three Targaryens. So taking this as a, a theory about leading into the, the future about who should be riding dragons and all the rest of it, it's a thematic link because there are three dragons now in the same way that there were three dragons before and because Drogon, the main dragon, is there who is in every way an echo of Beleriand, the Black Dread. The links are very clearly there. Uh, but it's not so much about a direct prophecy, in my view. Um, 
uh, where are we at? Let's take uh, one more question uh, and then we'll go quickly into the, um, the chat again. Um, John Lamb, I said I would get to your question. Um, you were, well, it was a comment really, uh, rather than uh, a question. You're talking about Liana and Rhaegar going missing, not explaining their actions to their families, knowing full well the Mad King and the Starks would be left in an impossible situation. They acted like children with little or no regard to anyone else. This ain't romance. It was a selfish act of fantasy with no regard for anyone and poor judgment. Okay. Um, this is an excellent point. Uh, my, I, and I, th I think I agree on one level in that, yes, they didn't think through their actions hugely. This was just a, um, a little bit spur of the moment, uh, certainly for Liana. Uh, Rhaegar, I think, felt that there were more important things than worrying about what was going on in the kingdom at the time. But timing here is, is I think, everything. Let, taking this from Liana's perspective, first of all, she probably, we don't know, but she probably was in Harren Hall uh, and probably had been left there waiting for the uh, the wedding of Brandon and uh, Catelyn uh, Tully, as she was at the time. So she basically wouldn't be missed for the next couple of months or more, at which point she was expected to turn up at River Run. So she probably thought, as she was somewhere friendly, the Wents were who were uh, owned Harren Hall, um, they were on side, and if they didn't say anything, then she could probably get away with going missing for a couple of months or so, and nobody would really know what was going on. She was quite an adventurous sort, so she thought, you know what, I can head off, and then I can reappear, and it will be fine. So from her perspective, that's okay. Uh, alternatively, she might at the end of that time go, you know what, actually, then I'll announce that I've decided I'm not going to do what my father said and I'm just going to elope. I think that that was her thinking. She was just going to see how it panned out, but she had a, a get out to turn up as she was supposed to at the River Run and, at River Run and no one would know. When they did head off, if they went straight down to um, the Tower of Joy, that would have taken them, my guess, uh, just judging on sort of travel times we've seen around there, at, at least six weeks, maybe a little bit more, maybe a couple of months. Now, by the end of that time, whereas at the beginning the country was at peace, at the end of that time the country was in complete civil war. It happened that quick. There was uh, Brandon charged down to King's Landing first, we're told that took two weeks. Then uh, he was uh, immediately locked up. Then Aerys sent off the fathers. Uh, they arrived, it seems, within a month, and then they were killed. The, then the Ravens went straight out to uh, summon um, Ned and Robert, and they refused, at which point war broke out. So. Actually, the, the change from there not being any war and nothing going on at all to we're at civil war took about six weeks. It was really quite quick to, to move through. Um, and if they were traveling, Rhaegar and Lyanna, they would have to travel off grid, so to speak. They would have to stay away from like the major cities. They would have to stay away from uh, lots of communication. Uh, with the outside world. So it is very likely that when they arrived, wherever they are arriving, that was when they discovered it was all too late. They had thought that they could just like sneak off and nobody would notice them for a little while. But then when they got there, they suddenly found it was far too late. And that was the point at which they, uh, they had to decide what to do. So I think that uh, in terms of running off, not knowing or caring and then not communicating it to anyone uh, and this uh, megan elizabeth veach thank you so much i picked up on your uh, you are a patron but i saw you popped a question over on facebook um you can find me on facebook incidentally people or twitter or instagram just have a look for in deep geek uh, but megan was saying i really love to get at how leanne 
connected with radar and not send words to anyone for so long. This combines with that as I think that she thought she could just get away with it. And uh, combined to that, I think she did tell Benjamin. I think that she did let Benjamin know. And she probably thought he was the only person she could trust with this. She couldn't tell Brandon, her eldest brother, because Brandon had already once, she, she will have seen it, when Rhaegar crowned her the Queen of Love and Beauty, Brandon stood up and had to be physically restrained from confronting Rhaegar. She couldn't possibly tell him that she'd gone off with Rhaegar. Ned she couldn't tell, because Ned was currently right next to Robert Baratheon in the Eyrie, and she'd had a conversation with Ned where she tried to say, hey, Ned, Robert Baratheon's not really the kind of guy for me, and Ned had go, oh, nonsense, he'll be fine, just get married and all the rest of it. She wouldn't think that she could trust Ned. She couldn't tell her father, because her father would definitely say no. The only person she could trust would be Benjen. So I think she told Benjen, and that was the limit of it at that point. Um, uh, and then in terms of how did no one know she was pregnant, I suspect that for all of the later period of her pregnancy, at the very least, she was in the Tower of Joy. So uh, yes, people may, well, some people will have discovered that, but uh, I think that that could have been relatively contained news. Um, it was, I wouldn't say commonplace practice, but there are several stories in real life of of women who would have, it, when they became pregnant, they went off somewhere on a long holiday for six months to a year and then emerged and nobody knew that they'd had a child at all. So uh, this was, as I say, it's not common practice, but it, there are plenty of other examples of it happening. And then lastly in that section uh, about uh, sort of the practicalities of the journey and communication and all the rest of it, um, Andrew Burnett says, uh, one question I've had is surrounding the time in between the tourney and then meeting up at Harren Hall um, and then making their way to the Tower of Joy. It all seems so well planned, but with such a distance to travel, how did Robert or Ned or Eris or John Aaron not hear about them? Uh, because by land you have to travel through the Stormlands or uh, did they go by sea? So, um, in the show, you're right, they made it seem very see very easy, no one guessed. In practice, um, in the books, I think, yeah, there are two ways they could have done this. Either just staying off-road um, and going across country, uh, you didn't have to go down the King's Road, they could have sort of gone off down, uh, off the beaten path, They will. There, there were ways through there, and once they were um through um uh, the marches because yes they they would be going through the stormlands but this is through the marches which are, are basically like um uh sort of downs um sort of um, moors if you like um you could cut across if you knew where the castles were you could just avoid them relatively easy or it's not that far uh from uh, if you want to go by sea, it's not that far from around Harren Hall. You can just nip off uh, a few miles uh, and get uh, a boat, ironically, uh, near uh, in, on the Trident, uh, near the Ruby Ford, and you could get a boat from there, just near the salt pans, and head all the way out and around, uh, and then dock somewhere, say, Starfall, and then head across the mountains the other way. Uh, so there are ways to do this. It is possible. Um, and in terms of how Robert or Ned or, or whoever didn't know, then that would be how they didn't know because they just stayed off radar. Uh, it's not like today when you can like track people going around everywhere. If you're just riding on a horse through open country and this is a massive country, then it is possible to, for, to, to go missing. Um, uh, so I I don't think it will have been easy, but it's certainly very possible. Even in that time, we had Ned, who hacked off through uh, the the Vale, through the mountains, and then across some water uh, before reaching the north. Um, that he seemed to manage, and nobody found him. Robert Baratheon took a boat 
um, across to the Stormlands from um, Gull Town. Again, he wasn't caught, even though boats were out to try and find him. So this did happen a lot, even then at a time of war. So yes, uh, they could have been caught, but they weren't. Um, at which point, guys, um, I'm going to uh, let you know a few things that are coming up on the channel. Then I want to very quickly dip into the chat because I know that there, I can see there's a lot of really good questions and comments coming through uh, and I don't want to lose out on them. In terms of, uh, and I know some people are pointing out when I'm taking my glasses off and putting them back on again, I'll keep them off for a moment. Uh, in terms of what's coming up in uh, on, on my channel over the course of the next few weeks, we've obviously now got the build-up Game of Thrones season eight. I will uh, be announcing soon how I'm going to be covering that. But I imagine if you went through my Westworld season two coverage, imagine that, but at a slightly higher level. So what I'm probably going to do, I will keep my normal Thursday live stream. These live streams, it really works for me. Uh, people seem to uh, engage well with it. Uh, and I will build on that by doing another live stream as a pre-show, probably at uh, 10 p.m. my time, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, on the day of the show. So it's just a few hours before the show, just as a chance just to recap what happened last episode, answer a few questions, and then um, build up to the show and what are we going to be looking for in that episode coming. So that one I will probably have some guests on each week uh, so we can talk through a few of the issues then I will try and make sure within 24 hours of each episode, I will do my breakdown. I will also do a breakdown of each of the trailers we have for the next episodes and of any specific issues coming up. So that's how I'm going to be covering it uh, when we get to season eight. In the meantime, my traveler's guide is going to be carrying on. Um, I am going to finish off this epic series about the Robert's Rebellion and the Tower of Joy. I'm going to be doing a video on, um, firstly, uh, R plus L equals J. I don't think I can go through this uh, series without covering that, so I'm going to set out why I personally believe that that is uh, the truth of it. I'm going to do a video on what happened at the Tower of Joy. Um, this is obviously, uh, we don't know exactly what happened, but I think that we've got enough information that we can um, uh, we can draw a few reasonably strong conclusions about what did and didn't happen. Then I want to talk about, um, I probably want to do one about Aegon or Phaegon, um, whether he is really baby Aegon, uh, Rhaegar's eldest son, uh, or not. Uh, that's a book character of your show only people. Uh, and then finally, I want to do one, it might turn into two because I think it's going to be a mammoth one, uh, about Blood Raven and Howland Reed and how they were manipulating events all through that period and how they were really at the heart of what was going on. So that's what I'm going to be doing to finish off that series. Uh, that should, I, I imagine, I'll probably get do one of those every couple of weeks or so because they're quite big videos, uh, but that should take us nicely up to the start of season eight. My second channel, uh, The Well Told Tale, if you've not come across it before, please do check it out if you are interested in audiobooks, audio narration. I'm working my way through uh, what I consider to be the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. We've just finished Jekyll and Hyde, which is a great story. If you've never read it, um, uh, I go through, do long form episodes, one a week, but at 45 minutes on average each episode of just audio narration. I don't I don't put any adverts in the middle, so I don't break up the flow of the story. It's just audio narration uh, every week. If you're interested in that, then uh, please do go and check it out. Um, I think I might do H.P. Lovecraft yet. I haven't fully finally decided, but um, uh, yeah, uh, have a have a quick uh, look at that if you're interested. And then finally, um, patrons, thank you. I say this every week. Uh, I mean it every week. I cannot do this without you. Uh, Patreon is uh, is where I put additional material for the supporters of the channel. Uh, so if you're at all interested in supporting the channel, you want to get access to things like uh, my audio narrations of the pre-release chapters of The Winds of Winter um, and a few other random goodies I put on there, as well as advanced access to uh, the videos I put up on YouTube please do go check out my Patreon page, patreon.com slash IndieGeek, and there's a link down there in the description as well. 
think that's enough in terms of notices. Um, did have a uh, super chat. Um, uh, Rod Dammit says, 520 people watching. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for letting me know. Um, it's uh, It's been a delight for me seeing how this uh, this live stream has grown uh, over the... I started it about a year ago uh, and thought, well, I'll just... I'll stick to a particular time and it's been... It's been fantastic to see how the, the audience for that has grown and the, the chat room is, has been uh, fantastic a sort of growing presence of, of really clever, uh, uh, interesting and fun chat going on there. Uh, we had super chat from uh, Carrie Nevers um, saying uh, Sontevia Major would like to know, and uh, again, I love it when people do this, picking up on great questions that I might have missed in the chat and, and putting them on super chats. It's a very easy for me to see super chats. They flash up in colour for me. Uh, and uh, quite a lot of the time, I, uh, it's easy to miss other ones. And when people effectively do a super chat on behalf of someone else, I think that's incredibly kind of them. So uh, the question here is, um, if I think Rhaegar took Lyanna to the Tower of Joy to hide her from the others, since there are no weirwood trees there, that's a good question. No, I think the reason he took her to the Tower of Joy was... Uh, because that was what he thought going to be the safest place for them to be. I think once they'd realised what was going on, that this was um, civil war, then it was quite hard for them to be out in public. If Robert Baratheon had found them, then who knows what was going to happen. Um, so I think Rhaegar wanted a safe place for them. And the people that he thought he could trust the most were the Martells. Um, so I think that that's what happened. And I think if you watch the video I did uh, that I released a few days ago, incidentally, um, people have pointed out that video had a few um, weird wobbly things going on on the screen. I don't know what happened there. Um, I will make sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, but uh, Deleting and then re-uploading videos on YouTube is quite a hassle, so I'll probably leave that one up as is, uh, but because I, I think most people tend to listen to my videos rather than watch them. But uh, anyway, that's that's by the by. But in that, I said um, that I think that it's probably also quite likely, as he would have had to do some negotiating with um, Doran Martell, regardless of what was happening, he would have had to do some negotiating with Doran Martell, uh, whether or not it was a, he was suggesting a polygamous marriage, whether he was suggesting an annulment, whether he was suggesting taking on a um, uh, the Anna as a paramour, any any of those things would have required him as the future king, because that's what he saw himself as, to make sure it was okay with the Martells because he was married to Elia Martell. And I think that he would have found that easier to square that off with him if he were in and under the protection of Dora Martel in Dawn. So I think that was what was going on there. I don't think that he thought at that particular moment in time the others were about to invade. I don't think that was where his mind was. I think he probably thought at some point they would. But the fact that he thought it was his son, Aegon, who was going to be the prince that was promised, seems to imply he thought that that would be needed 15, 20 years in the future. That was probably his mindset because his son had to grow up in order to be the prince that was promised. So uh, I hope that one provides a, a good answer uh, for you there. Uh, Maura Lee, thank you so much again. Uh, another wonderful um, uh, super chat uh, saying, we patrons appreciate you as well. Thank you, Robert, for all your hard work and your great videos. Maura, thank you. I can only repeat what I said at the top of the video. You are, I think I said this in my last, one, uh, you are always the MVP here. You're such a support to me personally and uh, a bit of a superstar within the community. So thank you. That's uh, that's incredibly kind. Um, um, do, 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 do. Let's quickly, let's have a quick flick through uh, other questions. Um, uh, Joe Magician is um, is in the chat. Hi, Joe. Joe was on last week. Uh, Joe, I am going to make you a moderator, given the fact that you're now moaning about it. <laughs> Joke, uh, but you are now a moderator. 
a bit of chat about Septon, uh, Septa Lamour. Um, now, uh, question is who she is. I think I'm going to do a whole video on that at some point soon, probably just the other side of um, season eight, because uh, she is a fascinating character. For those who don't know, she was part of this gang with um, uh, young Griff, who is um, Aegon, Phaegon, or claims to be uh, Aegon, Rhaegar's eldest son, and has been teaching him. So she seems to be part of the plot. She seems to be very well read, and Tyrion has his suspicions about her. It's possible when I'm doing my video about, um, about Aegon, Phaegon, I will pick up on that one um, uh, then, but if not, then I will definitely do uh, a question, um, uh, a video about Septon Lamore at some point after that. I had some question, uh, some people talking about uh, the Well Told Tale, saying yes, do um, uh, do some Lovecraft. Very happy to uh, muse Angenou. Hi, good to see you. Do a bunch of Poe. Edgar Allan Poe is also on the list. Um, and um, Rod Dammit pointing out weirwoods white walkers equals ww is that a coincidence i don't think it's a coincidence i, I think that george r. r martin was very aware of this um and uh, i i think it's uh, a showing of the balance again um, i don't think it's a big point but i think it's just one of the little bits of wordplay george r r martin loves the wordplay particularly with names incidentally it's it's well worth having a look at some point when you look at the characters who are in disguise and you see what names they have then uh that um uh, that's quite an amusing little um joke i think that george often does for himself so for example Arya at one point is cat of the canals and then um sansa is elaine and you add cat and elaine together you get cataline cataline their mother's name, and there's a whole load of these little uh, little word plays that he does quite a lot. Um, uh, think that's um, so. If um, Greek Weirwood says, if Robert, this is Robert Baratheon, found out about John, what would he do, and what would Ned let him do, and what was Benjamin willing to get involved in? Uh, lots of questions there. I think if. If Robert Baratheon found out about John, the fear was that he would kill him like he wanted to kill every Targaryen. I, I suspect, given his character, that if he discovered, yes, he would hate any offspring of um, Rhaegar and he would want any offspring, offspring of Rhaegar to be dead because they would be a potential alternate claimant to the throne. But also there would be a very personal, visceral reaction, I think, to any child of Rhaegar and Lyanna. So I think that is entirely right. And this is entirely where the whole Promise Me Ned thing comes from, a need to protect John from uh, Robert Baratheon because the man has a temper, let's put it that way. Um, okay, so let's get back to the questions from my patrons. Um, uh, Although quickly, Muse Ingenue, is, is there any popular theory that I find absolutely absurd? Um, I don't know about absurd. What One thing that frustrates me is, is the many, many, many um, so-and-so is secretly this. I, I personally recognize George R. R. Martin does use this, people going undercover but I think that it's actually, literarily, George R. R. Martin is an exceptionally good writer, um, but literarily, um, the so-and-so is secretly a such-and-such -such, um, is quite a cheap trick for a writer. It's quite an easy way to get a surprise, and George R. R. Martin tends to operate on a slightly higher level than that. And it's not so much any one specific so-and-so is secretly this person or whatever, it's the idea that there are so many of these out there that if we took them seriously, and a lot of them don't have much by way of evidence to back them up, if we took them all seriously, then every single major character is actually secretly somebody else, and that just does not work for me. Um, so, uh, uh, B. Uh, Pendarian, um, 
Did Robert and the other lords learn the truth after the rebellion had started? And after learning the truth, they dismissed it as a clever ruse by the Targaryens. Uh, Robert Baratheon wouldn't want to stop anyway because he had basically enjoyed the battle. Um, and would he then take the lie to his grave? Um, this picks up on the idea that uh, Littlefinger says it, a uh, story that the truth, what we have is a story we agree to tell each other over and over again until we forget that it's a lie. Um, so did they know, I think one of the things that I discovered while making my last video in that series about uh, Rhaegon the Anna was, and I think it was something I knew already, and I think we probably all knew, but hadn't actually spelt it out, was quite how many people were in on this. Because you have to start adding it up, that you go, okay, we all knew that Rhaegar and Lyanna were there. He set off apparently with half a dozen of his uh, companions. Uh, now, so that's already then we've got another another half dozen people of those. We know probably Arthur Dane was one of them. Oswald Went was one of them. Gerald Hightower turned up later. He was one of them. They probably all had squires with them. Um, then we get Shara Dane, who probably knew what was going on. Uh, if as we if we follow the logic that I've said, then Doran Martell had to be involved in this kind of uh, toing and froing. Elia Martell would have known. Um, then we also get House... Fowler, who are the, the Lords of the Wide Way, which was, they would have been, at a particular time of war, they would have been marching up and down the Prince's Pass, and so they would have known who was in the Tower of Joy. So somebody there would have known. If they're sending ravens to and fro, then the maesters probably would have known, and you just get more and more and more people, and it gets added on and added on and added on. So actually, what gets sold to us as being this really tight-kept secret was known by a lot more people than we probably originally think. That doesn't mean that Robert Baratheon knew. Um, I, I suspect that people would have kept it from him. Um, I think that the evidence we have from, um, from book one, when he arrives up at Winterfell, the first thing he does is go off to uh, the crypts to pay his respects to Lyanna. Now, uh, that is such a strong reaction all that time later that I just don't think that if, if it was a lie, he would not feel that strongly about her, then yes, he might feel that he had to do it in order to keep up her lie if he did know, but not the first thing he did was go to, go to see her grave. So no, personally, I don't think that it was a, I don't think he would have, he would have known. Uh, it was known by more people than we might expect, but not a, a huge amount. Uh, Mike, um, I think those are Australian dollars, $12.34. Thank you so much. Uh, just sending my thanks for all your great in-depth analysis. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you to say. Um, Piano Diva is asking, Piano Diva 11 this is on Patreon, is asking about uh, the annulment argument that I put forward in my last video. Asking, I'm curious why you went with annulment in your most recent video rather than polygamous marriage. It seems to me that all of the same elements that you made the case for in supporting annulment, a, a corrupt septum, uh, successful negotiations with Doran and Elia, the need to keep all of his heirs legitimate, work out better under a polygamous arrangement, particularly since Rhaegar was convinced of the exceptional nature of his family line and seemed to idolise Aegon, Rhaenys and Visenya. I think this is, uh, this is all very true and I wouldn't wish to disagree with any of that. In I think in Rhaegar's mind, probably also in Elia's mind, that would probably have been the best solution. The, the reason why I plumped for that, and indeed, sorry, I should probably say, uh, I think that as you say there, that the whole logic plays through again as to what would have had to happen and why they were in hiding for so long, because they would still have had to clear this off with various people. They would have had to make sure that the High Septon was okay. They would have to make sure that 
uh, Dora Martel was okay and all the rest of it. So I think that the logic of the video holds whichever way you go on that, whether it, it was, they were trying to go for a polygamous marriage or whether they were trying to go for an annulment. The reason why I went with annulment was because we quite often get into this mindset of thinking about, well, what would Rhaegar want? What would work well for the Targaryens and all the rest of it? I think that he probably went with that mindset. That was where he went into this uh, uh, with, but we have to try and understand as best as we can what Lyanna would have wanted, because this, was, this wasn't just about what Rhaegar wanted, this was about what both of them wanted. And we don't know huge amounts about Lyanna, but we know that she was independent-minded, she probably wasn't easily swayed, and as a result, she, the only hints, sorry, I should say, the only hints we get about what her views are on marriage is that she doesn't want to be married to somebody she doesn't like, doesn't respect, thinks might sleep with other people. Um, it seems to imply that she's she personally, as she also because she was brought up in a very northern uh, way, thinking that monogamous marriage was the only way, uh, everything seems to suggest that she would have wanted that. And if those if there were two options on the table, she would probably say, no, I want this. And so I think it makes sense to me that if both of them would take the same amount of hard work from Rhaegar to get them happening, he would still have to talk to the High Septon, he would still have to clear it with uh, Doran Martell and so on, then I think he would plump for the thing that Lyanna actually wanted, because we have to give her a voice in this. I suspect Rhaegar would have given her a voice in this, so I think we need to give her a voice in this. So I agree with the logic. It works either way. But that that uh, what we know of Liana suggests to me that she wouldn't have want a polygamous marriage. Then we are going to move on now to some questions about legitimacy. Um, Jack Hurst, uh, thank you. I said I'd get to your um, uh, question eventually. Uh, thank you for the super chat again. Um, loved the video in the week, Robert. So much information I had to listen twice. Thank you. Um, in terms of Liana, I think my only question left is how little questioning Ned got by saying that she died of a fever. Seems like since a whole rebellion was started overthrew a dynasty, people would demand more details on the circumstances of her death. Um, yes, we don't. The, the fact is, we don't know. Um, what kind of questioning he got. Um, what we do know is that he carried her body back with him. So the fact that she was dead was indisputable. Um, when he sort of passed by King's Landing, he could just say, well, there's the body. Um, so ex if he were then asked, how did she die? He could quite easily say she got a fever and people would would buy it. Why would they have any reason to doubt what Ned Stark says? Um, so he was even then, I suspect, known as quite an honourable person. So uh, we don't know how much he was questioned, but there's also no reason for anybody to query his version of events. Um, the, the, the fact that she was dead was the main point, not how she died, if that makes sense. Um, Maura Lee, um, again, thank you again for the, the, the super chats earlier, asking about R plus L equals J. Saying, especially on the show, this is the case, I believe it is in the books uh, as well. In the books, John is still dead. Uh, true. Um, if Rhaegar and Lyanna did marry so that Rhaegar's child could fulfill prophecy, be one of the three heads of the dragon, be in line for the Iron Throne, how would John prove his claim? So I don't think, um, and you go on to ask about, you know, saying in Sam and Gilly, we're reading about the annulment uh, and brands or revision, is that's going to be what's, is that what's going to happen in the books? So in terms of uh, the first part, I don't think that um, 
Rhaegar was wanting John because he thought he was going to be the prince that was promised. I think he thought that he was going to be um, a female Targaryen. Um, I, and I think that he thought that, that that child would take the role of Visenya as being like the warrior queen, as it were. Now, um, uh, the so that meant also that the the person, the baby that was John, in Rhaegar's mind, would not be in line to the throne. They would actually be third in line to the throne. First in line would be his child, Aegon. Second in line would be Rhaenys, who was the firstborn uh, girl, and then would be the person he thought would be Visenya, who was John. So um, just on a point of detail, because we look back on it and see John as the only surviving child of Rhaegar, therefore the heir, that's not how Rhaegar saw it at the time. And at the time, nobody would have thought, Doran, when he was dealing with all of this, wouldn't have thought that the child born of Lyanna would have, or any child born of Lyanna, would have been uh, heir. That was the whole point of it. Aegon was going to be the heir, not the child of Lyanna. In terms of the second question, how will this claim be proven that how will it be shown that John is the child of um, Rhaegar? I think that it's entirely possible that some of the ways that they use in the uh, on the show will be used again in the books. I think that um, it's entirely possible that Bran will do a little bit of investigating. I think that Sam, if there are any legal things that happened, marriages being annulled, other marriages, pardon me, I think it's entirely possible he would find those out. But the big thing here, I think, is going to be Howland Reed. I think that they would, they've they been using on the show Bran as a sort of a shortcut to tell us all of the backstory. In the books, I think Howland Reed is the person who's going to be able to give us the backstory. And I think that he, as the last surviving person who was at the Tower of Joy, other than John, obviously, who was too young to remember, he is the witness to it. And he, let's not forget, is a lord. His word it should be taken seriously. So um, I think that he will be the person who will appear in the books to tell us what happened there and to, um, uh, to give John's, um, I think his claim to the throne, I think is probably the wrong way to say it, but if John's claim to have Targaryen descent some credence, or indeed to tell him that he has Targaryen descent. Um, so uh, I think that's what's going to happen there. But what I would emphasize, which is something I emphasized in the video, was that um, this is not going to be a clear cut. John is the first in line to the throne, therefore he should be the next Targaryen king. I think that what we saw in Fire and Blood was hugely important to our understanding of the Targaryen succession. Every generation of Targaryens, literally every generation of Targaryens in Fire and Blood Part 1 had a succession crisis. This isn't just like a random thing that just happened with the Dance of the Dragons. Every single generation after every king, there was a succession crisis. We had when Aenys took over uh, after Aegon the Conqueror, there were three rebellions against him. Um, when when we get um, uh, Maegor taking over, it was against uh, when there was somebody else claiming when when uh, Aegon was there claiming to be the heir because he was announced as being the heir, but Maegor took it by force. Jaehaerys effectively took the throne by force because actually Maegor had named Arya Targaryen his heir, um, but Jaehaerys took it by force. After him, he had to call a great council in order to decide who was next in line to the throne. And even then, people were grumbling, the Velaryons were grumbling about it afterwards. That led to the Dance of the Dragons after the next king, by Viserys. And, and then so again and again, every single generation, there is a dispute about who should take over the throne in the Targaryen, in the Targaryen line of succession. I think the Winds of Winter and the Dream of Spring will give us a good old-fashioned Targaryen succession crisis. And I think John is just going to be a part of that mix. I think that 
as with the show, that's going to start to take a backseat to what's happening in terms of the, the others coming south. But we are definitely going to have uh, Danny and Aegon, the person claiming to be Aegon, and John a bit later, probably all there with their supporters saying that they are the Targaryen heir. So we're going to have a, a, a big confrontation about who actually should be next in line to the throne. Uh, and it's not just going to be, oh, well, they can all just get along and decide between themselves, or it's very obvious who it is, there will be a succession crisis. Um, uh, Karis the Beast asks, again, we're talking about succession here. Um, was John ever a prince since both um, a Aerys and Rhaegar had been killed prior to his birth? ending the Targaryen monarchy. Now, uh, as, a, as a matter of uh, principle, it seems likely that John was born before Aerys was killed. Now, uh, we're told that, um, well, I won't go into the huge amounts of detail there, but, but Daenerys is eight or nine months older than uh, younger than John, uh, and we know when she was conceived, uh, and that tells us that John was born before um, Aegon, uh, before Aerys was killed by Jaime. So uh, the Targaryens were technically still in power um, uh, when he died. The, the you, could, but this all kind of brings this whole issue back to the, the question of we think about succession uh, nowadays as being quite a quite a clear thing uh, just thinking in England with the British monarchy everybody knows who's next in line to the throne who's in line after that who's in line after that that's not how it has worked in Westeros it's who can back up their claim the best and they are the people they're, they're the person who's who takes over and Robert Baratheon um, became king. Yes, they came up with some weird uh, link, not really a weird link, but sort of a, a tangential link between him and the Targaryens. But nobody disputed the fact that there were actually Targaryens who had a stronger claim over in Bravos. So um, it's not a matter of who has got the strongest claim. It is a matter of who can back that up with might. And so, uh, yes, I think the answer to your question is technically uh, John was a prince, uh, as in he was born while the Targaryens were still ruling. But I don't think that actually matters in reality in terms of who has claims to the throne. Um, uh, who uh, ate Steiger? Uh, I probably mispronounced your name completely there, um, uh, with uh, a super chat saying, when do you think we'll get Fire and Blood Part 2? I think that that will be quite a way away. So George R. R. Martin at the moment is working on the Winds of Winter. I think he's going to carry on working on that for a bit more. I am holding out hope that that comes out in November of this year. That's what I'm hoping for that. Then the question is, what does he do after that? I suspect that he will probably go and do a couple of other side projects. Maybe we'll get another Duncan Egg story, something a little bit lighter from him. Um, Fire and Blood Part 2, I think, therefore, at the very earliest, is a couple of years away. But he's not started working on that yet. So the implication is it may well be after. In fact, I kind of hope it's after not just the Winds of Winter, but uh, a dream of spring. So it could be a few years down the line. He has got other things he's wanting to write. He's got other things that he's doing with his time. Uh, and he's got two mammoth novels that he has to finish off. And we know that he really enjoys doing Duncan Egg and will do more Duncan Egg. So I think that we're going to see a bit more of that before Fire and Blood Part 2. Um, Andrew Burnett says, is it possible that Lyanna had twins? with Ned taking baby John and Ashara taking yet to be named Targaryen. Well, possibly, but 
for my money, you have to then kind of like follow the logic of if that, then what? If we've got Ashara taking this other Targaryen baby, who's this other Targaryen baby? Now, we've got two or three possibilities here, I guess. You could say that the tar- that other Targaryen baby is Danny, but personally, I can't see any reason to doubt her backstory. We got lots of witnesses to to the fact we know where she was born, where she grew up, and all the rest of it. So I don't think there's any hint of that there. Could be um we were talking about uh Aegon. Um it could be that she uh, has been bringing him up and saying that he's actually baby Aegon. Um and she maybe some this is some people speculated maybe she is Septa Lamore. Uh, but I personally don't quite buy that because she was a central part in the Rhaegar plan, um, uh, which is very much about um, tied in with Howland Reed, I think, and uh, Blood Raven and all the rest of it, and why they would want to create a rival pretender to the throne. And not only that, but why would they pretend that they were somebody who they aren't? It just doesn't quite work for me, which I think leaves the third option uh, there, which would be that perhaps she took uh, Ashara, went up to um, uh, the neck with um, Howland Reed and then raised that baby. That baby then would be Mira. Now, there are lots of kind of rumours about, therefore, are Mira and John twins. Uh, I've seen that. I think that that's actually a lot more um, to do with the the visual similarities between Kit Harrington and um, Ellie, what's her name? Ellie Kendrick's hair. Very curly, dark hair, look very similar. Uh, I think that says more about the the actors that they cast in the roles and any evidence that that might be true. Um, I can't see why Howland Reed would be wanting to bring up somebody and never tell them who was uh, with both Targaryen and Stark blood in them and not tell them who they are. That just does not make sense to me. Uh, So the most likely thing there, I think, is not a, a, a twin's I can't see what you have to ask where the other twin goes and none of the big options work for me there. I have to say, um, uh, getting, um, lots of people buying, uh, Kelly Morrison saying I buy H plus a equals mirror. This is Howland and Ashara versus mirror. Excellent. So do I, um, uh, Zen Maester saying we just love mirror and want her to be real important. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think, I think I want her to have a uh, a good uh, a good role in it, um, and Piano Diva Eleven also agreeing with the uh, the idea about Ashara is Gianna Reed. That's uh, uh, Hannah Reed's wife. Um, I, I agree. I like it. It's a fun theory, and I think that there's a lot of evidence to back it up. Um, Let's move to a few slightly more random questions, uh, which are linked into this, but I haven't uh, brought them together. Uh, Maura Lee saying, who is Fagon or fake Aegon? Is he truly Rhaegar and Elia's son or someone Varys put into place, claiming that he is their son? Um, uh, Maura, you name check a few theories that he might be a Blackfire, that may be the son of Illyria Mapatis. Um, maybe a boy that Varys just found who looks the part, maybe some descendant of um, um, Aryan Targaryen who was in the Free Cities for a while and so on. Um, there are a lot of theories out about who this is. Personally, I think that the clues that we have are that this is a black fire um, because uh, Lirio is very clear that the Blackfire line died out on the male side, by the, they die out on the female side. I think that um, the the clues there are clues there about the fact that Illyrio might have a sword, which could well be Blackfire itself. Um, there's things about that again. Illyrio drops in stuff about you know a, what what does it what does 
black and color matter, red or black, it makes no difference. Um, and I think that all the hints are that actually he's a black fire um, who has got the Valyrian look about him and has been raised up to be, and I think this bit is probably true, has been raised up to be a good and noble and wise king. So I think what we're probably faced with here is somebody who has been raised up to actually be the kind of king that Westeros needs, but they're not who they say they are. Maybe maybe that person doesn't even know uh, that they're not who they're, they've been told they are. Um, but that's my best guess. Uh, I will get onto that, as I said, in another video later in the series. Bonds asks uh, about Rhaegar's death. Being that Rhaegar's armor had rubies, could he have been glamoured with someone else in a similar way to Mance and Rattlebones? If so, who? Um, I did a video on this one um, a while back. My take is that, yes, theoretically, you could have um, glamoured a body to be to look like um, Rhaegar. Rubies are certainly there. Rubies seem to be important in terms of glamouring. Um, but if you believe that to be the case, you then have to follow the logic through. You have to say, OK, so this body, uh, presumably once and we hear that the rubies were scattered um, uh, after the, the blow hit and killed Rhaegar, um, presumably breaking the, the, the spell. You have to say, OK, so nobody noticed that that wasn't actually Rhaegar uh, who was there. We hear that Rhaegar was burned. Um, so again, lots of people, nobody realised that this wasn't Rhaegar. And fundamentally, you have to say, OK, if Rhaegar wasn't there, what on earth has he been doing all this time? Uh, let's say he then he then sent uh, somebody off to die in his place, which incidentally doesn't actually sound very much like Rhaegar. Rhaegar was very self-confident. I don't think he thought that he was going to lose in the slightest. I don't see why he would have sent someone in his place, but that's a slightly different point. But, the, but if he had done that and he were down there hanging out in the town of Joy or whatever, What's he been doing for the last decade and a half? Where Where is he? Um, why didn't he try and make contact with uh, his um, uh, his relatives who who uh, Viserys and, and Danny, who just their their star fell hugely. They were they were in exile and then they were in penury. They were going. Uh, he was called the Beggar King. Viserys was. Why didn't he try and make contact with them? Why didn't he try and make contact with John? What, where is he in this narrative? It make, To me, it makes absolutely no sense that somebody who was that driven by prophecy and his role in prophecy and his son's role in prophecy would have just not had any input into the story. So, yes, it's theoretically possible, but I don't think it matches the character of Rhaegar to do that in the first place. I don't think it matches the character of Rhaegar to be not doing anything since then. And I don't think it is likely after the spell had been broken that they would have just not noticed that it wasn't Rhaegar. Uh, so um, I don't think that that's the case. Um, uh, finally, from my patrons, but guys, uh, this is your last chance to drop some questions into the chat uh, because uh, I think I will probably wrap up in a few minutes. Uh, Maura Lee, your final question was, how I see the story ending? Do I see somebody sitting on the Iron Throne at the end of the book series, or do you see a different uh, setup to run the nation? Um, I think that we are not going to see the Iron Throne survive this. I think that the Iron Throne was uh, the thing which was set up, it was the Game of Thrones, the thing that was set up to be what everybody's struggling over. But one of the big themes about this is that while everyone's struggling over that, there's a bigger threat coming at humanity. So it's very clear to me that what we've got is a situation where uh, at the end of it, that has been shown to be a cause of a huge amount of uh, pain for humanity. And so I think that the Iron Throne has to go can't see it surviving. That means 
Pardon me. That means that we're not going to get, I think, one king sat on there ruling everything. Uh, you talked a bit about a council, possibly. I think that's entirely possible that there might be a different way of running things. Uh, because let's let's remember when people like Danny talk about breaking the wheel, what they're not meaning is changing the government system. What what she means by that is she's going to be in charge, um, and running it largely as it was before, but with her in charge, not somebody else. That was uh, and th that was what her idea was. If we really break the wheel, then we have to get rid of the kind of feudalistic monarchy system going on there. I don't think we're going to end up in some wonderful uh, modern democracy. I don't think we're going to go there at all. Um, and in fact, I don't think we're going to see uh, a huge amount about the how this all plays out. And I know that's going to be quite disappointing, but I don't think that George R. R. Martin is going to do a 20 years later gun thing like in the Harry Potter books. So this is what happens a little bit later. I think we will get uh, a bit about how it's going to set, be set up and work, uh, but that's, that's it. And it wouldn't surprise me if we're actually left with more about the characters who are left and less about the actual systems that are put in place. And I think that we're going to be left to trust the people who are there because we know and like and trust those people. We trust them to build a good system rather than actually over the course of the next year, they did this and that and the other and they called the council and then they did this. I don't think we're going to get that level of detail there. Maybe afterwards, George R. R. Martin will tell us, but I don't think that's going to be in the books. So something which isn't um, uh, an iron throne, um, uh, but uh, not as far as full democracy. Um, Let's get a few more questions just before we end up. We'll end up in about 10 more minutes, I think, and then we'll, uh, we'll finish off. Right. Um, uh, Andrew Kay saying, not much of a wheel break to simply reinstall the Targaryen dynasty, not all that far off from the last Targaryen monarch. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the point I was trying to make, was that when Danny's talking about breaking the wheel, She's talking about herself being in control. Um, do, 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 do. Let's go. Um, uh, Cheech and Chong says, Euron won legitimately and fans hated him for it. I don't think readers really want a Magna Carta. Um, so the first half, part of that, is, I assume, is a, a reference to um, um, Euron winning the King's Moot uh, to become uh, the, the king of the Iron Islands. Yeah, he did win legitimately. That was how it works. The Iron Islands do, the, the captains there decide who becomes the king. And that, I don't think anyone disputes the fact that, that he, he won. Um, the fact was that he won over characters that we emote for. That's the bit that I think. Um, some fans don't like him for. Um, in terms of, I don't think readers really want a Magna Carta. Uh, if that's referring to um, a uh, how the the system as a whole is going to work forwards, um, I I actually don't think a Magna Carta would be that bad. This is getting into political theory here, so forgive me, but I don't think a Magna Carta would be a that bad a way of doing it because Magna Carta was just trying to hold back the powers of the king. It was just the first step in getting towards the end of uh, feudalistic monarchy. It didn't end feudalistic monarchy, but it was the first step. It put ed edges on the power of the king by creating principles that, um, uh, that uh, all are equal under the eyes of the law, which we kind of accept take for granted nowadays, but that's kind of founded that kind of principle as a as a way to run a country, regardless of what station in life, everyone's equal and, and everyone has a right to trial by their peers as well, that kind of thing, um, which as it had been under the Targaryen rule and, and Robert Baratheon's rule as well, was that basically whatever the king said went, and that the king said that, right, that person's guilty, they're going to die, then that happened. So something which allowed a sort of a, a constitutional monarchy to go forward would actually work a little bit better, I think. Um, so I wouldn't mind the Magna Carta. 
Um, uh, Romy uh, Zavera Vendercult, uh, apologies for mangling your name, saying, uh, what are you going to do after the series ends? Uh, I did talk about that a little bit earlier in the video. I am going to carry on making videos about A Song of Ice and Fire, that's for sure. Um, there will be the books to cover, there will be the spin-off series of Game of Thrones to cover, and I am looking to uh, to pick up on a, uh, a few other series. If you've been with my channel a while, you know that I previously covered Westworld Season 2, so I think I'll probably pick up on Season 3. And there are a few other things like the Lord of the Rings series and Black Mirror that I'm also quite interested in, uh, in covering too. I'm going to stick with Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire, though. Don't worry about that. The, the level of content that I produce on that is going to stay there. Uh, I'm just thinking of adding on extra things onto it. Um, and, guys, I did spot when I asked you what you thought of which things I should be covering. I saw a few of you uh, went there and, and uh, were cheering on Westworld and Black Mirror, so thank you. Um, I, I, I noted that, and uh, I will definitely be looking into doing that. Uh, we did have a couple of uh, super chats that I will quickly pick up on. Catherine Scully uh, with, uh, that looks like, five Canadian dollars. I think Westeros will slowly become a constitutional monarchy with a parliamentary democracy over a few centuries. Yeah, it could well do. I think, um, uh, I think we shouldn't um, assume it's going to get too far in the lifetime that we see it uh, here. Certainly not a proper full democracy. I don't think that's going to happen. But the the idea of a constitutional monarchy might well work. Um, and the idea of some sort of council um, uh, that, uh, that rules and uh, the council elects the king rather than it being done by a, um, a succession, that might also work as well. There are a few different ways that they could do it. But yeah, uh, over a few centuries, I think that the, there will be some progress um, anime lover Nicole, did you answer the question that I asked about the absence of Liara? I'm not sure I did. Uh, if I missed that one, I apologise. So this was a question um, that you put over on Patreon. Uh, I think it was anyway. So apologies, I can't see it. So maybe I didn't answer that one. Um, this was about um, the Rickard Stark's wife, who is the mother of Ned Stark, Lyanna Stark, Benjamin, and Brandon, of course. Um, and is there a possibility that she died giving birth to the youngest child? Um, this is entirely possible, Benjamin. Um, yes, it's possible. Um, we're not actually told huge amounts about it. The fact that nobody does reminisce about it does seem to suggest that it might have been uh, a sad Obviously, it would be a sad time if your mother dies, but maybe dying in childbirth may well be what happened. Um, the, the question is what how that affects stuff. Now, I don't I don't know because we don't know enough about some of those characters like Liana, but it is certainly noticeable that she was uh, raised in a very masculine household. There was her father and she had three brothers. And she didn't have a mother, and she, who certainly for most of her life, as far as we can tell, and she didn't have any sisters. And that seems to have played across a lot in terms of her developing character. She, like Arya, who a lot of people reference uh, Arya when they're talking about her, she seemed to really enjoy fighting. We get a glimpse of her fighting against Benjen with sticks. She loved riding horses. Um, these were things that um pursuits that were generally seen as being more masculine even in the north where everybody is perhaps slightly more equal than in the south uh, those were more male pursuits rather than female pursuits so that might well be one of the um the effects of of their mother dying uh, earlier was that liana grew up in a lot more of a, a male influenced um household but thank you for that. That was uh, five euros fifty. That's uh, that's very kind. Um, I we've got a couple more. Uh, Maura Lee. Oh, again, Maura. Thank you so much. You're, you again the MVP. Uh, great live stream today. Thank you, Robert. That's twenty dollars. Incredibly generous. Thank you so much. Um, 
Um, then we get Donna Daly. Thank you, five pounds. Uh, Rhaegar seems convinced that his kids will echo um, uh, the original Targaryens. Uh, where, why, when they were born in the wrong order? This is a very good question. He names his children in the wrong order. You would expect him to name Visenya first as the firstborn child. Um, my only speculative answer on this one, and it is speculative, is that uh, through all of my um, uh, sort of work on this, I've taken the approach that the decision to take on uh, an extra lover to have the third child with, um, that was quite a late decision because it was a it was a late understanding that Elia could only have the two children. Now, um, it's possible that um, he had some prophecy. We know that he dealt a lot with prophecy, had some prophecies that were suggesting that um, uh, perhaps it was the third child he had who would be the more uh, fightery uh, daughter. Visenya was, was, she was the first wielder of, of Dark Sister, she, uh, that we know of, uh, um, uh, from the uh, conquest onwards, and she was very warlike. Uh, Rhaenys, however, was a lot more um, involved in the court. She loved um, uh, spending time relaxing with musicians and poets and entertainers and the like. Um, and it's impossible that Rhaegar had some kind of prophecy idea that perhaps that they should be this way around and therefore Elia's children, who, again, she doesn't get a voice, but all the things we hear about her, that she was a lot more softly spoken, she was uh, certainly not a warrior or a fighter, her child would probably better match up to Rhaenys than the third child he had. That is pure speculation. I have absolutely nothing to base that on other than the order of the names. Um, uh, but uh, he certainly seems to think that there will be those three echoing the original Targaryens. So um, that's what kind of makes sense to me. Um, I wish I had more to back it up, but we George R. R. Martin hasn't given us more to, to back that up. Um, uh, Igreet Weirwood, uh, Rhaenys was the one who died in Dawn. Yes, she was the one who did. Um, uh, whether or not she died immediately or after some time, we don't know. Um, but I think I am going to call it a day there. It is just coming up to one o'clock in the UK now. So I think I um, uh, worked my way through my glass of water. So guys, I just wanted to say thank you so much. There's been some amazing questions here. We've got through a huge amount of content. Uh, great questions, not just from my patrons, always fantastic questions. Uh, the Super Chats, thank you, incredibly generous Super Chats today, and the questions in the chat as well. I've been seeing a lot of them go through. Apologies if I don't get time to get to yours. As you've seen, we had a huge amount of stuff to go through, uh, so hopefully I'll manage to get to yours next time. Next week, we'll be back here, same place, same time, um, and we will be looking um, uh, at... Uh, well, I haven't decided yet. depends on which guest I get. I've got a couple of guests I've got lined up who I think you'll be really excited uh, with, and I want to match the guests to the topic. So uh, tune in next week and find out who it is. Uh, but uh, guys, thank you again, particularly to my patrons. If you are interested in supporting this channel, please do check out my Patreon page. Uh, but everyone, take care, and I will see you again next time.